All right. I'll go I'll go ahead and start reading. We're at uh, page um on for principles of philosophy, page 110. We'll go me and then uh, Daniel and then Sandra. Um Usis is the name is is the name of the original Greek experience of being, that is, of discontingency, as experienced in the first inception of thinking. Let us therefore say once more what we mean by discontingency. Discontingency is the free onset or inception of sense, the flagrant whole of beings perceived or minded in its unsustained source, origin, or principle, the schism toward beings in whole. To the knowledge of discontingency belongs the following insight, the openness or flagrancy or truth of the discontingent principle is at once the fundamental trait of man's being, insofar as man's being in its turn consists in the openness to the principle and its need of having its flagrancy born. In other words, in the case of man, to be means to bear or suffer the flagrancy of the discontingent principle. The fact that the Greek thinkers initially experienced discontingency as physis implies the following both that which shows to them as the principle of beings and whole and their awareness of man as the being that awakens within the claiming need of that principle insofar as he finds himself having to bear its truth remains within the limits that are traced by that experience. For instance, when Heraclitus says that the principle of beings in whole is the logos, and that this principle is to be sustained through man's logos, attuning to the logos itself, so that a fitting knowledge of the logos, i.e. the sophon, consisting in the awareness that the one atones all, may arise. Then all of this is said from within the experience of physis, physis. Therefore, we must now briefly outline the sense of this word in the context of Heraclitus' thinking. Phusis comes from the verb phuel, which means to bring forth, beget, engender, let grow. Usually we understand and translate phusis as nature. In both meanings, this word has for us. The entirety of natural as opposed to artificial things and a given essential character, I am honest. I'm, I am an honest man by nature. However, if we simply substitute physis with nature in these given acceptations, not much is gained for our understanding. In fact, this translation by substitution implies that nothing new can ever be learned. In order to let physis speak to us according to the manner in which it is heard in Greek thinking, we must pay attention to the grounding trait that is indicated in this word, namely the trait of spontaneous self-standing rising into the open. Thus, Fusis indicates the original generosity and favor of the from itself arising, rising into the open and stable lying or abiding in the open of beings in whole. In this manner, physis is what lets beings in whole rise and stand in the open as such, thus setting them free into their appearing and being, and what finally keeps or preserves disappearing and being within itself as its source. Finally, physis is what lets beings arise insofar as they disappear and cease to be. In short, Physis is the stable rising that holds in itself all appearing and disappearing. Since Physis is the pure rising into the open in which beings are engendered as such and in whole, it is furthermore also a name for the entirety of beings. 
insofar as they are minded in their rising into the open, that is, in their flagrancy as beings. However, for man, when he finds himself in the middle of Fusis, beings in whole are primarily those beings that already rise and stand in the open, so to speak, with Fusis itself, that is, in a physical manner. Without man participating in this spontaneous rising into and standing in the open, Thus, Fusis can finally become the name, in particular, for natural beings, which, in terms of Greek understanding, means beings that spontaneously rise and self-standingly abide in the open. In other words, beings having the source of their rising and standing in the open within themselves. Man indwells Fusis, which he understands in this threefold sense, in that his own being is involved in it. In fact, he finds himself already engaged in his own being by Fusis itself, in the sense that as the being he is, he needs to obtain a stance within Fusis while standing his ground vis-a-vis Fusis, in such a way that Fusis itself is, in a sense, affirmed as such. And consequently, consequently, i.e. from the sense following measure, a human world can be built. In this manner, Fusis provides the original measure for all human building and dwelling including all knowledge of things conceived according to their physical traits. The most fundamental form of this knowledge is the knowledge of the principle itself that acts in Fusus, and indeed as Fusus itself. For the early Greek thinkers, it is clear that this principle already contains or rather consists in a reference to man's being. As we know, for Heraclitus, this principle is logos. In other words, he conceives of Fusus as having logos as its most inceptive and originally concerning trait. However, we need to consider a rich set of traits of physis, physis, the spontaneous self-standing rising into the open as the original Greek experience of discontingency. The first trait we need to mind about this rising is that it, it rises by itself and from out of itself. The second trait to which we need to pay attention is that the rising returns back into itself, into its, or its origin, and in this manner, recovers itself within and regenerates itself out of itself. The third trait we need to heed is that by virtue of the aforementioned traits, the rising is a, in it, self-standing source, in other words, it is a discontingent, stable rising. The fourth trait of which we need to be aware is that this rising has the character of an overwhelming grace and a lightning stable. The fifth trait we need to notice is that as this grace and favor, the rising has the grounding tone of a strangeness or weirdness that at once pulls off man and draws him to itself, thus attuning him in the sense of astonishment. The sixth trait we need to observe is that the flagrancy of the 
spontaneous and in itself standing, stable, rising into the open, is strange in that it bears in itself the contention with that which is against the openness, but from which the rising rises and from which the openness obtains itself in the first place, to wit, the trait of absconding. The fact that the rising into the open bears in itself that contention implies that the latter is constitutive for the rising itself. As a consequence, we can say that rising into the open is as such and thus consists in the contention with absconding. As a consequence, the flagrancy of this rising, the flagrancy in which beings as such and in whole appear and disappear, is in fact the flagrancy of absconding. The seventh trait we need to remember is that the rising into the open brings with itself the openness, i.e. the flagrancy of absconding, into which it rises. In other words, that which in this inception of beings as such and in whole is experienced as openness, is the openness of, i.e. brought about by and for, this spontaneous in itself standing rising of beings. The eighth trait we need to realize is that the rising into the open bears it in itself as a need or stress, the claim of being sustained by men. In other words, it needs men, who in turn awakens to himself in, i.e. as the addressee of, this claim and need, and knows himself as the being that exists in the expectation of answering. Having recollected these eight traits, we can now read two fragments about Fusus. The first one, fragment 123, reads as follows. As follows. Fusus, through absconding, it grants its favor. We need not dwell on a critique of the common translation of this fragment, which goes like this. Nature likes to hide itself. Heraclitus is pointing to the fundamental trait of Phusis. This trait is the favor that Phusis as such grants to the trait of absconding. In general terms, granting the favor to something in Greek phileonin as in the first component of, of Greek word means letting something else be by offering one's being to sustain and keep what frees that something to itself. And thus, i.e., while offering one's being in this manner, being free to one's, one's own self, such letting be is the sense of what we commonly call love. And in this sense, we may indeed say, the rising into the open love absconding. However, it is now clear that such love is not a matter of Fusus having an inclination towards hide and seekings as the common translation, which refers to the contingent circumstances would suggest. Rather, Fusus as such is fully itself. That is, the spontaneous self-standing rising into the open. Thanks to the fact that it admires and keeps within itself the loving contention with its source, i.e., that from which the rising is what it is, and which therefore is what is dearest to it. To wit, the trait of retreating into absconding, or simply absconding. The more Fusus abandons itself to this contention, i.e., the more Fusus offers itself to the trait of retreating and thus letting absconding be, the clearer and fairer Fusus itself, in gaining itself from absconding, is what it is, namely pure rising into the open. 
In other words, Fusus as such consists in and obtains its purity from the loving, favoring contention with absconding. Thus, the original Greek experience of discontingency is the rising into the open, physis, which is, as such, perceived as a contention with absconding. This elucidation of physis helps us to approach the Greek notion of aletheia, which is commonly translated as truth. Aletheia literally means this abscondedness. It is a primary experience for the Greeks that any openness, clarity, or flagrancy in which beings show as such, namely as appearing or disappearing, is in the first place wrested from absconding. However, however, as we just saw, this being wrested from absconding does not imply that absconding is negated and eliminated. On the contrary, it is there, namely in the very flagrancy of any showing, as the standing provenance and source of that flagrancy, a source that must be admitted for any truth to be obtained and kept at all, despite the danger that the same source might suddenly deny its own flagrancy, thus causing beings to collapse into sense and measurelessness. Thus truth, i.e. what grants a measured and integral appearing of to beings, is always truth by and in the measure of admitted quote-unquote untruth. This insight, however, amounts to reaffirming the following rigorous determination. The flagrancy of what is flagrant is nothing other than the flagrancy of absconding. While this determination may appear awkward and paradoxical at first, to a more attentive regard, it shows as the grounding trait of an experience that is familiar to all of us. The more we let go of all seeming evidence and supposedly assured knowledge, allowing the problematic, puzzling depth of the matter that we are interrogating to unfold. That is, the more we own to and bear its obscure, con confusing, inaccessible, intricate traits and aspects, the more sufficient and rich, but also the more promising of future insights will be whatever understanding that matter we eventually gain. For the purposes of our recollection of the principles of philosophy, the following should be kept in mind, as already pointed out above in the elucidation of the seventh trait of Fusus, the Greek experience of aletheia is, so to speak, encompassed and in a sense superposed by the experience of Fusus as the rising into the open of beings in whole. Thus, Aletheia is the truth or flagrancy or openness of, i.e. belonging to, remaining implied in the vigor of, Fusus, which in turn grants the appearing of beings in whole by granting its favor to absconding. In other words, it is in the first place Fusus that in its rising brings with itself the flagrancy that the Greeks called aletheia, this absconding. Just as logos is minded as the principle, the one atoning all within the experience of Fusus, aletheia is the truth and flagrancy of beings in whole which have in the first place arisen as Fusus. The contention of flagrancy and absconding is in the first place, a contention of Fusus flagrancy and Fusus absconding. That is, the contention as such remains enclosed in the domain of Fusus as the ever rising ground that bestows to beings their appearing and disappearing. Wow. 
as such. The last Heraclitian word, which we will hear in fragment 16, while it does not mention Fusus as such, the fragment nevertheless indicates two of its fundamental traits. This is how it reads. The by no means setting ever, how could anyone remain absconded with regard to it? The first part of the fragment seems to confirm our interpretation of fragment 123. What is meant by the by no means setting ever? Answer, Fusus. Why then doesn't Heraclitus simply say Fusus, since this, the forever rising, is clearly what is meant? Can we sim simply substitute Fusus for the ra rather clumsy formula? the by no means setting ever? The answer is, we could, but we should not. The reason is that the above mentioned formula indicates a fundamental trait of fusus, which the word fusus itself does not make explicit. Fusus is, for sure, the forever rising. However, thanks to fragment 16, we know that this rising is not a mere or plain rising. But a rising that obtains itself against, i.e., in contention with the setting or the going back in abscondedness. In other words, the rising is a rising from out of and against a setting. However, this implies an original experience of that against which Fusus obtains itself, namely, the setting, as a constitutive trait of Fusus itself. Fusus, as fragment 16 appears to say, obtains itself by prevailing over and thus averting the setting, which therefore runs as a fundamental trait of the flagrancy of being in full. Fusus as such brings about the flagrancy of setting precisely because it shows as that which itself, after all, by no means ever sets. Hmm. The second part of this fragment reminds us of the constitutive, insoluble reference to Ophusis to man's, as well as to the God's being. In fact, anyone can indicate both any man and any God, though for the time being we will constrain ourselves to explicating the relation between the by no means setting ever and man. In the question, how could anyone remain absconded with regard to it, speaks the astoundment of thinking with regard to Fusis and man's native engagement in it. On the one hand, it is said that man cannot ever remain absconded with regard to Fusis, in that the fact of minding his being minded and meant by Fusis, as the one who has to bear it in his being, is the perennial instant of man's own rising into the open, so that man is who he is only in the flagrancy of this mutual minding. On the other hand, given this astounding constitutive reference to Fusis and man, it is now in a different sense, astounding how man can at first and for the most part be, dwell, as if he weren't who he is, only in the flagrancy of this mutual minding, that is, as if he were absconded from, and therefore unrelated to and not engaged and concerned by, this contentious dimension that perennially claims and needs his being. In other words, how can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being? We can conclusively read once more the translation of fragment 50, which tells us about the logos as the principle of beings in whole. 
experienced as Husus in its constitutive reference to man's being. The latter consists in man's own logos, whose ground, be it inert and forgotten or awoken and at work in thought, is the unisonal, unisonal accordance with the logos itself. If you listen not to me, but rather to the logos, i.e. the gathering, if you mind it and tune into it and tune in with it, thus owning to your own being's native belongings to it, an accordance in gathering breaks a tune in one's voice, in which your gathering belongs to the same with and gathers the same as the gathering itself. In such a way that your gathering actually gathers the gathering itself, so as to let it gather. In the openness of that accordance, a fitting knowledge of the gathering itself is generated, as it shows as the one atoning all, that is, as the one that, by virtue of its atoning, kindles beings as such and in whole. Heraclitus's initial insights remain a source for thinking throughout the philosophical tradition to this day. However, his thinking is not yet a philosophical thinking in the rigorous sense of the word. As we sh shall soon see, thinking in the form of philosophy begins more or less one generation after Heraclitus with Socrates and obtains its definite form in Plato and his pupil Aristotle. Before turning to this beginning, we will, however, look at another one of the so-called pre-Socratic thinkers, Paramides. The discussion of his thinking will provide the opportunity to consolidate and deepen our understanding of some of the key notions that we have encountered in the analysis of Heraclitus' That appendix four is interesting too. Shall we read it? Which one is that? Just the next page. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I I I'll continue. Okay. Well. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Appendix four on abscondedness. Abscondedness is not about hidden as yet or far unknown, about somehow lacking, quote unquote, information. In fact, the latter, i.e. lacking information, is the reduction to contingency of the original phenomenon of abscondedness. That phenomenon itself, on the other hand, is the original material of which the truth in which we exist as human beings consists the rare openness and flagrancy of the mindable sense of things, as well as the rare manifestness and clarity of the visible experience of things. Abscondedness is the element in which, from which, and as which any experienced sense obtains its likely form. In other words, it is the primordial, itself mostly absconded, human experience. The following account of instances in which abscondedness becomes in some way conspicuous has a merely exemplary character. 
It is meant to convey a sense of the thematic phenomenon and give a first hint at its inextinguishable variety and richness. In the visible domain, we see things, but hardly ever really see them or discern them as such. They remain indistinct to our visual or otherwise sensible experience. A change of light, an unexpected encounter, and we see a mountain, a house, a hand, a familiar person, as if for the first time. We deal with something or someone often or even habitually, but our perception is partial, distorted, and lacks in depth Things remain fundamentally withdrawn from our understanding, and we mostly rely on impressions or on average sense that we picked up we don't know how or when. We experience an uncommon situation with someone we thought we knew well, and suddenly he or she shows himself or herself in a completely different light. We now wonder about that person's true character or personality, which, however, remains impenetrable and out of the reach of our understanding. There is in us and in others around us a persistent, though latent, confusion about certain fundamental traits of our world, death, birth, man, woman, natural, artificial, etc. We have a more or less explicit position in their regard, but this position is shaky and only stable as long as it remains untested. Example, we are called to a referendum on an important social issue. We ponder, collect information, but the issue remains controversial, confused and confusing. And even what the experts have to say appears to be insufficient. In the middle domain, we investigate, for instance, the optimal use of energy in a given economic context. What optimal energy, economic, and investigation mean we take as evident and given and we wouldn't begin to wonder about the origin and implication of our initial understanding of each of these concepts. In a reflective moment, our operative concept of optimality suddenly appears problematic. And with it, the nature of the knowledge we produce, we are perplexed, but we wouldn't even know where to start with an interrogation of that concept. Eventually, our perplexity fades and things go back to normal. Someone became aware of his calling as an artist and knows that what is demanded from him is to paint the truth. Yet, he feels incompatible, incapable of doing so as nature seems to refuse the proximity of the artist and fend off his artistic attempt. After years of abstinence, one day the painter goes out with his easel, canvas, and paint, and nature appears to him as a unique richness of true motive, motifs that demand to be recreated in, in a work of art, lest they are nothing. Someone interrogates the fundamental meaning of being, he makes a few steps, and the initial obscurity and confusion seems to give way to a clearer insight. But then the path suddenly breaks off, and everything collapses into obscurity again, before eventually a new approach to the same opens up. He who engages in an attempt of thinking knows he is on a path towards a withdrawn source and that this path which he must build every day 
with his interrogating is characterized by a peculiar mutual relation between enigmatic instance of clarity and obscurity. Wow. That's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Kind of what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> I guess we're on the right path then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, um, what is the word? Encouraging. He who engages in a, an attempt of thinking knows he is on a path towards a withdrawn source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yep. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for making us trudge you, through this you can you can you can give a virtual thank you to to, to evil <laughs> yeah, but thank for, you for, 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 for being so insane to, to write all of this. thank you for making us trudge through this it's really worthwhile really really worthwhile yeah yeah you can write him an email sandra saying thank you <laughs> yeah maybe i will yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know what to say, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that line for me, he who engages in an attempt of thinking knows he is on a path towards a withdrawn source. I think that is just perfect. Yeah. 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 Mm. And that would be a that would be a really really good line for a politician to adopt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, for the chant, I like the one question on page one hundred sixteen. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge he has insofar as he's a human being. Mm -hmm. That's on page 116 in the middle. In the middle. What, what page is that? 116 in the middle. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge he has insofar as he is a human being. Mm. Yeah. Yes. All right. Do you, do you five rounds of chanting? I'll go first. How can it how can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge she has insofar as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge he has insofar as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being. How can it be that a man forgets the unforgettable? The only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable? 
the only knowledge he has insofar as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has insofar as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has insofar as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has, insofar as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has, insofar as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has in so far as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has, insofar as he is a human being. How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has, insofar as he is a human being? How can it be that man forgets the unforgettable, the only knowledge he has, insofar as he is a human being? Go into short speech. <clears throat> We we can withdraw from being ourselves. How can it be? Where do I really exist? <laughs> <laughs> 
remembering, remembering, remembering. The image that comes into my mind is of the two fingers just barely touching each other, but gathering the entire spaciousness of the withdrawal source. Do I exist? Forgetting, forgetting. He who engages in an attempt of thinking knows he is on a path towards a withdrawn source. I think therefore I am not. The unforgettable withdrawals in being too near to remember. The mystery of being that it is announces itself to me. Do I do I exist? Remembering that I forgot is the start. I feel the urge to surrender to or into the mystery of being. 
the only knowledge I have insofar as I am a human being. is that I don't know. We are not at home in our interpreted worlds. Mm. To guard or walk near withdrawn source. We must keep asking questions and keep interrogating. even though I might resist it. I need to leave the false home of my interpreted world. I think that's five rounds. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. What's the next stage? Yeah. Very valuable. Yeah. The next stage is to give ourselves a break and Attend to our yeah. bodies. Sure. Yeah. Shall we end it here? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a good Then I will uh, end the recording. Okay.